Hello, comrades, and welcome back to the Shanka Show. Здравствуйте, товарищи. Well, I want to talk a little bit more about communism. I believe I already covered that topic several times, especially in my Soviet vlog uh, videos, uh, that Soviet Union never had communism. So people who claim that uh, communism is a danger and we don't want to repeat the same situation that happened uh, with Soviet Union here in the United States... Uh, they make a assumption or just a blandly lie that Soviet Union had communism. We never had communism in Soviet Union. Uh, official terminology by the end of the life of Soviet Union that we had developed socialism, развитой социализм. So like socialism was very developed. Like you have a nice to develop muscles, but you can't reach communism. You're not at the level of the Olympics. Uh, uh, Olympics, so you, you're you good, but not good enough. But we actually had a pretty uh, like decent plan how to achieve socialism and when. And so then we're going to talk about it today. In order to look at the Soviet plans for building communism, we need to roll our tape. You remember we used to have tapes so we could roll them back? So we need to roll our tape all the way back to October of 1961. And the leader of the Communist Party and the Soviet Union is Nikita Khrushchev. And he had historical um, speech on the 22nd gathering Siezd of the Communist Party. That's where the uh, Central Committee presented the new plans and new ideas and then people vote for it. And of course they get 100% yes votes. So that's when the Nikita Khrushchev announced that we're going to have a communism in the Soviet Union in the near future, not in 100 years, not in 200 years, but in 20 years. So in 1961, the plan was to build uh, the society in Soviet Union, to build the economy, because you can't have a communism without proper econo economical, you can't have communism without proper economical uh, base. So the plan was to create all that in 20 years. So on October 1961, more exactly October 31st, the last day of October of 1961, uh, Comrade Khrushchev announced that the today's generation of Soviet people will live under communism. So that was a huge thing. So it's not far away future. It's going to be really, really close. So the plan was... Quite simple. Uh, it had two stages. So we have two decades away, right? Uh, 20 years. So in the first uh, decade, from 1961 to 1970, Soviet Union going to create um, the base for communism. So they were going to develop economy and overcome uh, United States as the number one industrial power in the world. And will create improve the lifestyle of the Soviet people. So everyone will have uh, plenty of everything. The, all the collective farms will be uh, turned into highly productive and highly, um, they call it высока доходность, so even have a high income um, enterprises. So in, in generally, all the needs of Soviet people will be um, satisfied, including everyone will have a proper housing one of the huge uh, problems that Khrushchev inherited uh, from Stalin era is shortage of good housing. A lot of people lived in rooms. They didn't have their own apartments. They were lived in dorms in or so-called barracks, which I even don't know how to translate to English. So there'll be this uh, one or two-story basic building, which basically had only rooms. Uh, then they had a common kitchens and outhouse, like big outhouse. So there'll be maybe 20, 30 families living in this uh, basic building. No running water, uh, just electricity. And everyone used a big outhouse, com communal outhouse. So that was a barack. Uh, so Khrushchev, that was one of his uh, big changes that he implemented in Soviet Union. He started pushing for building massively... Uh, massively large amount of cheap apartments so put people in a better living conditions. Also in the first 10 years, 
the hard physical labor should disappear and Soviet Union uh, was uh, supposed to turn into the country with the shortest working day. So there was a quite a lot of optimistic assumptions. And I'm kind of curious about uh, heavy physical labor that is going to disappear, which I guess means automatization. Uh, you know, there's a lot of jobs that at that time in 60s and 70s, like coal miners, uh, people that uh, cut trees, a lot of work was done manual, but that was the plan to improve uh, working conditions for Soviet people and have it all done by 1970. Stage number two, which is from 1971 till 1980. So I was born right in the beginning of stage number uh, two in 1971. Unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, at that stage, Khrushchev already was in the power. He was removed and Brezhnev was the leader. And I believe actually Khrushchev passed away in uh, September of 1971. But the plan was that a second um, 10 years, there'll be uh, created a materially technical base for the communism. I don't know if I'm translating it correctly because I'm looking at the Russian text. But the material technical base. So you got materials and you got technolo technology base uh, for communism, which would provide the uh, isability, in other words, it's like pl uh, plenty of material and cultural benefits for the whole population. And the Soviet society will approach the level uh, when uh, communism's principle of uh, distribution according to needs will be able to apply so you know you basically come to the point and it's kind of interesting because right now if you look at the american society world society the productivity goes so much optimization goes so much it comes to the level like there'll be machines building machines to build machines and to build goods so that we have a conversation about basic income so people will get paid regardless of their work or not, because just not enough jobs, I guess. And so this is approaching idea of communism, but from the opposite direction. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the the whole general concept of communism, and I'm kind of looking at it because I remember studying that back in school, that you approach to the level when you got... Um, So you get distribution according to the needs. So what you need, this is what you're going to get. So that's the idea of communism. And also at that time, there will be a slow transfer to the option uh, of So that people's... Uh, so everyone will uh, own everything. So you don't have a private property anymore. There will be like people's property. So every you don't own apartment, you don't own uh, furniture, it's just, it's everyone's. So if you need it, you go get it at the store after using it, you don't need it anymore, you bring it back to the store, somebody else will take it. So kind of like that general idea. So that should be happening by 1980. So at that point, uh, there will be a complete communis communism society in the Soviet Union and complete will be in the next period. So after 1980, we pretty much will have a communism and we're going to wrap the things up in the next 10 years. So that's the plan. And as we know, we never had a communism built by 1980. And 11 years later, in 1991, Soviet Union uh, quit uh, and stopped existing. So as you see, Comrade Khrushchev was quite an optimist uh, when it came to the communist ideas. And, you know, Comrade Stalin never talked about it, uh, building communism. Uh, but Comrade Khrushchev, that was his main drive, that uh, Soviet Union will be uh, growing and building its economy. And uh, in 20 years, we'll have a society ready for communism. So it's quite interesting. And, you know, like a lot of people, 
uh, right now, especially in the former Soviet Union in Russia, right now, talking that Khrushchev betrayed Stalin's idea and he was the first that started destroying. But if you look at these plans on the 22nd the gathering of Communist Party, he was all over uh, for communism and had a, quite a plan how to achieve. But when he got uh, displaced and Brezhnev took over, um, there was uh, the language changed and they just started talking that we have a развитой социализм, so we had a developed socialism. And it's pretty much like, yeah, there is a light in the end of tunnel, but tunnel is very long, so we're going to just kind of move along and hope that one of the days we'll see the light and that's when the communism comes. But we're going to kind of similar like Bible, you know, uh, like religion. Jesus coming, but we don't know when, but you need to believe in it and, you know, act accordingly, give us 10% of your income, and one of these days uh, Jesus will uh, show up. And same as the in Soviet Union, we had our communist religion that, hey, you need to work hard uh, for little money, and one of these days the communism will arrive and everything will be fantastic. And as I mentioned earlier about the shortest uh, work day in the world, so the plan was that the people will be working for six hours a day and have two days off a week. So instead of eight, they'll work uh, six and have uh, two days off. And I honestly don't remember, I should do my homework, but I think during Stalin, people had only one day off on Sundays. They had to work six days in a week. And of course, collective farm workers had to work pretty much every day. Uh, one of the ladies, like distant relatives of my mom in the village, she was uh, working the milk farm, so she was milking cows. And she said, you know, cows don't care it's a holiday or Sunday or Monday, you need to milk them. So she literally worked uh, every single day of her life. She never had days off, so it's kind of, kind of interesting. And I'm looking at this illustration, so the, some of this information I took from the uh, children's book, school book. And um, it shows in the pictures what going to be free of charge in 1980. So when we're basically ready to step into communism. So at that time in 1980, housing, like apartments, uh, supposed to be free. Uh, which they were kind of free, but it was like affordable um, rent. You never owned the apartment in Soviet Union, so you'll get an apartment, you move in, you pay really uh, little rent plus utilities, but you never could sell the apartment. The only way people could like move to different area or different town would be to do the swap. And I want to make a separate video on that topic because that was a quite a pain in the butt. You know, if you live in Kiev and you decided you want to move to Leningrad because your uh, daughter got married and live there you can't just sell your apartment in kiev and you know buy apartment in leningrad you need to post advertisement in leningrad that you want to swap you know one room apartment in kiev for one room apartment in leningrad or whatever and of course you know market works everywhere so if you want to move from the small town to big city you might have to sacrifice three room apartment in chernigov small town in ukraine for one room apartment in Moscow, or people quietly paid extra money to compensate, you know, like to get upgrade. So you, of course, you'd never tell a government that you, you know, get a one room apartment in Leningrad and give people 10,000 rubles and in exchange for one room apartment in Kiev or something like that. So that was a really challenging uh, thing to move. Ex besides Prapiska, if you watch my channel for a while, you should know that people have to have get permission to move. Uh, so you, you don't just go, hey, I'm going to Moscow, and you just move to Moscow. You can't do that. Couldn't do that. You had to get permission, which is Prapiska, that you, will, you are permitted to live in Moscow. On top of that, you had to do all this movement of uh, exchanges, of your apartments but uh, so we kind of get a little bit distracted here uh, so besides free housing in 1980 soviet people should have a free public transportation uh, i remember paying five kopecks like five cents per ride pretty much for like bus trolley bus and uh, subway 
and also people will be getting free lunches in schools and at work so cafeterias you just go and take food you know you bring food you have to pay anything all the uh, kindergartens and uh, any special schools will be free of charge and as well as uh, drugs will be free of charge as well as a uh, health treatments if you want to go to some spa uh, to recover from your health issues uh, that should be also free of charge in 1980. so it's kind of interesting and there's optimistic view of comrade khrushchev that he could build a communism in soviet union and a mere 20 years and as we know it it didn't happen he got removed from power and as a result soviet union collapsed in 1991 uh, in 30 years after meeting in October 1961, I think it's exactly 30 years and one month, I believe in November of 1991, Soviet Union stopped uh, quit to exist. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video and as always, don't forget to put likes and share with your friends and we'll talk to you soon. Hello, comrades, and welcome back to Shanka Show. Здравствуйте, товарищи. For those who don't know me, my name is Sergey and I was born in the USSR. Today I would like to address one peculiar situation that comes up in the comments under my videos about Soviet Union versus United States, who was more aggressive country. And quite a few people pointed out of the famous Khrushchev saying, we will bury you, which was even, or as a Steen put it, Mr. Khrushchev said, we will bury you. And I don't support to that point of view. So here we are again, going back to the funeral topic, since it caused a lot of grave concerns of some of my viewers. So let's dig in this issue and look at what did Comrade Khrushchev mean when he said, we will bury you. Now, please keep in mind that I'm not a language specialist, and it's just my personal opinion on this topic. Russian expression, I will bury you, or we will bury you, it's kind of similar to the American expression, English expression, my dad will kill you. So if your girlfriend tells you after she discovers the condom broke that my dad will kill you, doesn't really mean you'll get killed. Similar Russian expression, we will bury you, doesn't really mean that we're going to put you in a grave after killing you. In order to understand why Khrushchev said we will bury you, we need to look at a little bit of a background, what was going on in the Soviet Union at the same time. And keep in mind, once again, it's my personal opinion, that I see Nikita Khrushchev is a Soviet version of Donald Trump. Just like President Trump has a lot of famous powerful slogans, build that wall, lock her up, make America great again, Comrade Khrushchev had his own slogan. One of the famous Khrushchev slogans was Dagnat i perignat Ameriku. To catch up with and pass by America in economical development kind of area. It looks like his first time slogan Dagnat i perignat Ameriku to catch up with America and pass it came up around May of 1957 when he was talking about lifting agriculture to the new level and in three years soviet union supposed to be perform better than america in production of milk meat and butter if you calculate it like per person consumption production and consumption so that was the target in 1957 in three years to overcome america and agriculture production but of course the idea of catching up with america was nothing new Long time ago, Lenin announced that in order to achieve the final victory of socialism, we must catch up and overcome capitalist countries. It just didn't specify that time that was America. But then in the 50s, of course, the main enemy of the Soviet Union became USA. So that was the main target to catch up and overcome the United States economically. So in Russian language, there is a expression that if someone totally will dominate you in the sports field, most that's used for the sports, they say, hey, don't try to raise him, he will bury you. So my opinion is that what Khrushchev meant, that we will bury you, is like in our race to catch up with America and beat them economically, we will bury them because we will be much better than the United States. But of course, if you translate, we will bury you word for word, 
it sounds very scary and very aggressive. And of course, it's not the first time when translation went wrong. Just recently, we had a situation when Trump said this. One nice thing about it. Because, because Putin, Putin called me a genius. Putin, Putin said Donald, Donald Trump, Trump is a genius. I don't know Putin. I have I'm, no I'm idea. I never met yeah. Putin. This is not my best friend. I don't admire him. But in reality, Putin said this. So Putin said that Trump is Yarki Chilavyak, Yarka Lichnast, which you can translate word for word like a bright person, bright personality. It got translated as brilliant person by some brilliant translator, and it went further that Trump understood that Putin called him a genius. But in reality, if a Russian person calls you a bright person, Yarka Lichnost, it's more like sarcastic way of saying you're a clown, you can be taken serious, you are very bright like your colors, but you have nothing behind it. Another example of silly misunderstanding and bad translation is the topic on Russian forums that Americans eat dog meat because Americans like hot dogs. I'm dead serious. There was a post that some lady used the vocabulary and found out that Americans like to eat dogs. And another example about this one, I'll need your guys' help because we're looking back to some times ago to the famous comedy Police Academy. And if you recall, there was a gay bar called the blue oyster now i have no idea why a word gay which if you look at the vocabulary it says it's a happy cheerful person right how the word gay became attached to homosexual person but in russian language and once again i don't know why a word blue which means color голубой that's the word we use to describe gay person so when you say hey he's gay in Russian, you say on Galuboy, your he is blue, like color white. So you see, in this case, just by chance, the name of the gay bar Blue Oyster translated to Russian perfectly correctly. So in Russian, it sounds like gay oyster, and it's where I need your help, guys. I asked around for any ideas why the gay bar had the name Blue Oyster. And most people had no idea except one person, and he's actually is a Mormon, but he said that he thinking that blue oyster, and we go into slang words again, man, that if the woman goes to that bar, she becomes really sad. Blue as sad, and oyster is the bad word for the female part. That she goes there, and for her oyster, there's nothing to do there because it's a gay bar, so that's a blue oyster bar. Do you know anything about it? Please put in the comments. I'm very curious. Well, somehow from the serious topic of the Soviet Union planning to bury the United States, we ended up all the way to the blue oyster topic. So I apologize for that. Well, I hope you like this video. As always, don't forget to put likes, share with your friends, and we'll talk to you soon. До свидания. Goodbye. Don't worry about it. Okay. Just concentrate on your accuracy. You're about right there with Smith and Wesson. Just leave the weight of it. There you go. Take your time. Keep your arms stretched out. Huh? I mean, can think about catching it. No, don't worry about it. The accuracy is a thing. Where did you hit it at? I don't know. Oh, I, I see where you hit it. Like I say, you carry now, you keep the gun pointed down, take it down, and you go. Uh, 
headphones help you? Oh yeah. Yeah, if you didn't have that, shit, your ears would be ringing like crazy. So there you go, just, just empty it now. Just keep on shooting. I can't quite tell where it went. I think, I think I'm better just doing freehand. It's gonna huh? make me wobbly on this thing. I'll just do freehand. Go ahead. Shoot. Did you count how many? Keep going. If it if it clicks empty, that's good to see if you're jerking. Just keep on shooting. See, you did jerk. See, the uh, instructor actually do that. They'll leave around purposely empty. Live, and when you went click, you know, it's I empty, you jerked a little bit. You can't do that, or you're supposed to not do so. That's a good experience to do that. So this won't see where you shot there. Yeah, I shot the camera. Yeah, just, so just lay it. It's empty, but just lay it over there in the container. All right, a little bit. <coughs> but we can still figure it out. But see, if I had the masking tape, I could tell it right from back there. We should have a spotting scope. Okay, where are we at here? Well, you hit right here. See? That's my best shot, I guess. Yeah, right here. Right here, I guess, because that's not circle. So you hit one, two, this one here is yours. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. That's three, four, five. And that one next to yours to the right up. You just circled. That's a yeah, we circled that yeah. the first shot, didn't we? So that's six of them, right? Yeah. see my two shots and you're in the upper right even a little bit higher to the right. Huh, I'll take and uh, do three more shots and the gun will be empty. above it right now, which is good for left and right, which they call that uh, windage, you know, mm -hmm. but it's, it's definitely consistent, it's shooting too high, that's called elevation, so this is a, the thing here, you take that cap off, we'll do that later, and, and turn it down a little bit, okay. but for the right side, left and right, which they call that windage, that, what you're doing is pretty good, but we need to lower it, because it's too high on the uh, uh, 
up and down, which is elevation. So yeah. I think you got a couple yeah. more to go. Or is it? Yeah, go ahead. You're 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 loaded. Yeah, go ahead. If not, it'll be empty. It won't hurt anything. It's always good to do a pencil yeah, empty to see if you're jerking, you know. Because if you shoot one that goes click because it is an empty casing, if you jerk while you do it, that means you're jerking it. And that's a good thing to do just for your training. So go ahead. Up ahead. I think you might have one or you might be empty. Bring her over here. <coughs> now, lever and your, oh, it didn't go. It brought them out, but I just got a little bit more to go. But that's a retractor button or lever there, mostly out, but, and then, uh, gun here. This is a newer gun here, 44 Magnum Smith. <coughs> and see, I took the regular back sights. This is the front sight with that red bar there. It's called the mm -hmm. uh, uh, ramp, red ramp. That's the front sights. The back sights I actually took off and put this uh, where I got my finger. It's aluminum. Uh, it's a weaver base. It's a base to screw on to the gun. Mm -hmm. And then where my finger is, this base adapts to the the scope, or in this case, red dot scope. So that's how that works. So we'll get six more of them. You want to load it? I'm just filming it. Go ahead, Jay. And again, it's loaded. Ready to go. <coughs> Hello, comrades, and welcome back to Shanka Show. Здравствуйте, дорогие товарищи. My name is Sergey, and I was born in the USSR. Just a friendly reminder that my book American Diaries is available on Amazon.com, or shoot me an email if you would like to have a signed copy. Thank you. Вы смотрите программу Shanka Show. So we have a question from MOG404. Sergey, as always, your videos are great and very informative. Since this video is about Khrushchev, uh, I have one question. So this question was posted under my video that I dedicated to Nikita Khrushchev. Why did Khrushchev, or we say Khrushchev, seemingly arbitrarily transfer Crimean autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic from Russian Republic to Ukrainian Republic? I can only surmise that Khrushchev was Ukrainian and he wanted to gift in parentheses his republic in parentheses with some nice real estate, black sea beaches and so forth. That said, what are your thoughts on Russia's reclaiming Crimea? Vladimir Putin has a point. Historically, prior 1954, Crimea never belonged to Ukraine. A commonly accepted belief is that Ukraine was going to join NATO and Russia would lose its navy based in Sevastopol. Well, first of all, I need to mention, for those who don't know yet, that I am Soviet Ukrainian. So I was born in the Soviet Ukraine. So my opinion, of course, will be somewhat biased. So in January of 1954, Crimean region, at that time it was no autonomous republic of crimea it became autonomous republic only in 1994 before that it was krimskaya oblast so crimean region so it was officially transferred uh, from russia to ukraine at that time they were part of the soviet union right so there was from russian federation it was transferred to ukrainian soviet socialist republic 
And if you look at the map, you'll see that Crimea is actually its peninsula, right? It's called Crimean Peninsula. And it's attached to Ukraine. It has no border with Russia whatsoever. And Soviet government came up with two reasons why this transfer should happen. First of all was because of the economical and like physical connections between Ukraine and Crimea. And second reason was to celebrate 300 years since rejoining of Ukraine with Russia. So, воссоединение Украины с Россией. So, there was a big celebration in some places. And it was kind of like, I guess, a present from Mother Russia to Ukraine. Like, thank you for joining us. And here's Crimea for you. So, what were they talking about? What kind of rejoining happened 300 years ago? Well, in 1654, the leader of Ukraine, well, at that time wasn't like the whole country, it was a small region controlled by Zaporozh Cossacks, Hetman Bogdan Khmelnytsky. They had so-called Periyaslav Rada, so big meeting in Periyaslav, that's the name of town, and Bogdan Khmelnytsky asked Russia for protection from Poland. You see, through the history, Ukraine found itself in a bad spot. They had a powerful pretty aggressive neighbors all over. Russia from the north, Poland, or at that time was called Rech Pospolita from the left, from the south was Osman Empire, as well as Crimean Hanat. Those were like uh, together. So in 1654, Ukraine asked for Russian protection, asked to join Russia, and only 55 years later, in 1709, Ukrainian Cossacks under Hetman Mazepa were fighting Russians on the side of Sweden. I'm talking about famous Poltava battle where Peter the Great won against joint army of Sweden and Ukrainian Cossacks under Mazepa. And to wrap up our historic detour, you need to know another date, that in 1791, Turkey, or at that time was Osman Empire, signed a peace agreement with Russia and agreed that Crimea belongs to Russia. So that's when Russia finally took over Crimean Peninsula in 1791. And now let's go back to 1954 to celebrate in 300 years since rejoining Ukrainians with Russians, and why Crimea was gifted to Ukrainian Republic by the Ukrainian Khrushchev. Well, first of all, Khrushchev was a communist, right? And communist is automatically means you're internationalist. Think about Stalin. He was Georgian, but he changed his last name. He took Stalin instead of his Georgian Jugashvili, and I don't think that Stalin transferred any territories to his home republic or his home country of Georgia. Secondly, we're talking here 1954. Nikita Khrushchev came to power just a year prior, in 1953. He became first secretary of Communist Party of the Soviet Union after the death of Comrade Stalin. Full and challenged power, he managed to get only five years later in 1958, where on the top of being a first secretary of Communist Party, he also became chairman of the Council of Ministers. Back in 1953, he still had to deal with Malenkov, with Molotov, Varashilov, and other you know, old-timers, let's put it that way. So he, there is no way Nikita Khrushchev could make Crimean decision on his own back in 1953. You also need to be aware of the fact that Khrushchev went on a secret inspection to Crimea in the fall of 1953. So a year before Crimea was transferred to Ukraine, Khrushchev actually went to Crimea with inspection, and it wasn't pretty. What I found out looking around on the internet that it actually, you know, of course they were getting uh, reports from the local leaders, from Crimea and of course they were rosy that everything is great but 
you know, they knew the real numbers. So Khrushchev got tired from these reports and he went there personally. That's kind of Nikita Khrushchev style. He always liked to deal person to person and see it in person instead of reading through the papers, trying to figure out, you know, separate truth from lies. His son-in-law went with him. I believe his last name was Adjube, and uh, he mentioned that Russian settlers, Pirisilensi, like surrounded Khrushchev car and started complaining about unbearable life conditions and shortage of food, poor housing. They were complaining that potatoes not growing here, that cabbage dries and withers away and they can grow cabbages. So they were newcomers. They were Russian settlers that came to Crimea after World War II. So Khrushchev got upset and he asked them like, so why did you come here? And they replied, well, we were forced. And they lied to us. They said that conditions here are fantastic. So we need to pause here because there's something unusual happening, right? We're talking about Russian new settlers in Crimea. So why do we have Russian Pirisilensi, Russian settlers in the Soviet Crimea? And it sounds like there's people who came having no idea how to grow crops in the southern peninsula because those were mostly peasants from Volga region, from colder areas of Russia. You see, Crimea had huge population loss. And a lot of it, of course, because of the World War II, there was a lot of battles going on in the Crimean Peninsula, defense of Sevastopol, German occupation, but it's not the main reason. Just like Milli Vanilli blamed it on the rain, population loss must be blamed on Comrade Stalin. When the war started, and we're talking about the Great Patriotic War, when Germany attacked Soviet Union in June of 1941, Around 50,000 Germans were evacuated or deported from Crimean Peninsula into Siberia and to Kazakhstan. And we're talking Germans that settled there several hundred years ago it was when Catherine the Great invited Germans to settle in Russia. But the main population loss happened after the end of the Great Patriotic War. In 1944, around 250,000 Crimean Tatars were deported from Crimean Peninsula, from their homeland, into Kazakhstan mostly. And a lot of them died there. Apparently some Tatars collaborated with Germans during the war and it upset uh, Comrade Stalin greatly, so he decided to punish the whole population. So they've deported everyone, every Crimean Tatar, and send them out to Kazakhstan. And we're talking, I think the time frame was like in about a week. And KVD troops showed up, they surrounded villages, they told people they have 12 hours to pack and put them on the cattle trains and send them out. So one day you have 250,000 Tatars, a week later there's just empty villages and hungry dogs are in route. And only Around 1990, 1989, under Mikhail Gorbachev, the Tatars were allowed to return back to their homeland, back to Crimea. Okay, so now we're going back to 1953. Sorry about another uh, small historic detour. And guess where Khrushchev went from Crimea? He flew straight to Kiev to talk to local leaders about situation in Crimea. And of course, you know, Ukrainians like, well, it's part of Russia, not much we can do. And uh, Khrushchev said, well, we need real Southerners there. We need people who know how to grow orchards and corn, not potatoes. And what do you know, a year later in 1954, let's celebrate 300 years of rejoining Ukrainians with Russians. And we'll have a little present for you guys. There's a Crimea in very, very bad shape, and I hope you know how to fix it. And of course, everyone voted yes. I believe the only person who said no, but no one cared about his opinion, was the communist leader of Crimea. So he was properly removed, but there was no mass uh, Russian uprising in any Russian cities. 
We just transferred Crimea from Russia to Ukraine, but was still part of the Soviet Union, so no one cared about it until 1991, when the Soviet Union went kaput. And from what I read, if push come to shove, Ukraine was ready to transfer Crimea back to Russia, but push never came, Yeltsin never bothered really hard to demand transferring Crimea back, so our leader Kravchuk kept Crimea with Ukraine, and that was a ticking time bomb since then, since 1991. And look what kind of picture I found in my bottomless archives. Uh, this is a picture that shows Kravchuk running away with Crimea cheese. You know, he has this Cossack hat, and grandma crying grandma is Yeltsin. So this kind of shows that Kravchuk outsmarted Yeltsin and managed to run away with Crimea. Now it looks really funny and not funny, but at that time I, I was so impressed with that picture that I cut it out and kept it. And of course, the main reason Russia was so upset about Crimea is Sevastopol. It's the big military port and it's like the Russian pride. There's a lot of history uh, with Sevastopol. So that's the main reason and it's always was the main Soviet Navy base. So Ukraine ended up renting uh, Sevastopol port uh, to Russia for all these years. But of course the whole idea that if Ukraine would join NATO, then NATO would put their military base there. Like that base, Navy base, only makes sense for Russia somewhat because Black Sea, if you look at the map, it's like pretty much like a big lake and it's locked in Turkey. If the Turkey was a member of NATO, decided not to let Russian ships leave, they are trapped in Black Sea. So the Sevastopol has really kind of not a lot of strategic sense, in my opinion, but I wonder what you guys think. And to the point uh, that Vladimir Putin has a, has a point that historically Crimea never, Crimea never belonged to Ukraine, I mean, historically, Crimea never belonged to Russia either till 1791. So how far back in history we need to go to restore historical justice, right? I mean, Soviet Union took over Northern Kuril Islands, took it away from Japan. Even Japan never attacked Soviet Union and Soviet Union had agreement with Japan about uh, not attacking each other, but Soviet Union broke the agreement, attacked Japan, and then as a punishment took away islands. But I don't see Putin talking about that those islands uh, never belong to Russia, so we should give it back to Japan, right? And then, of course, we had two agreements. Uh, first one was when Ukraine transferred all the nuclear weapons that uh, remained from the Soviet Union. They transferred it to Russia. And the part of the agreement between Ukraine, Russia, and United States was that United States and Russia would respect, it's interesting, Clinton didn't want any guarantees to protect Ukraine in case of any trouble. He's a smart lawyer, and we know that. Huh? He's a, uh, what is that, Slicky Bill, or whatever the nickname he had. So he made sure that there was nothing in agreement would be that America would protect uh, Ukrainian territorial integrity is just that uh, United States respects Ukrainian uh, territorial integrity. So we had that agreement and then in 1997 there was another agreement about friendship between Ukraine and Russia and part of that uh, agreement was that Russia accepts the fact that Crimea belongs to Ukraine. So Putin actually with his actions uh, he broke two agreements one uh, that happened in the early 90s during a nuclear weapon transfer and another one in 1997. So that's, in my opinion, completely illegal and it must be reversed and Crimea should be returned back to Ukraine. And that other argument is actually people of Crimea made their choice. They went to polls and they voted uh, to become part of Russia. How about Ukraine pick some republic in Russia if we want to see, kind of work things that way, 
for example, we will pick Chechnya and we will have a vote in there to see if Chechens want to be part of Russia and see what happens. Because Chechens twice already tried to express their desire to be a separate republic and twice Russia bumped them uh, into nowhere, into tomorrow, uh, and kept that republic under its control. So this whole conversation about, well, there was a people of Crimea made that decision. It's so bogus, it's not even funny. Okay, so I hope uh, you like this video. I hope you learned something new. As always, I enjoy your comments, so please uh, write your thoughts under this video, and we'll talk to you soon. Today we will talk about Nikita Khrushchev, who was the leader of Soviet Union for nine years from 1953, when Comrade Stalin passed away, and all the way until 1964, when he was forcefully retired while being on vacation. This forceful retirement made him the second Soviet leader who didn't die while being at power. So the only Gorbachev and Khrushchev are two Soviet leaders who survived being a captain of the Soviet ship. I was born in July of 1971 and Comrade Khrushchev passed away on September 11, 1971. So for two months, me and Nikita Khrushchev uh, lived together in Soviet Union. So that's the short period of time when we were on the same page with the former leader of USSR. Soviet leaders always liked awards. And of course, nobody could beat Leonid Brezhnev with his deep passion for any shiny medal he could get, Khrushchev still had a quite a few awards himself. He was the hero of Soviet Union one time and hero of socialist labor three times. And looking back, comparing the Khrushchev with the other leaders, I would say he was probably the most unusual person at power at the USSR. I probably could say he was the Trump of Soviet Union. One of the problems of countries like Soviet Union, Cuba, North Korea, when the power structure is, it's like a pyramid upside down. So you don't have a system when the death of the president makes the vice president a president right away. In Soviet Union, you had to get some kind of meeting of the leaders and they should make a decision who's going to be the next uh, leader of the Communist Party, which means the leader of Soviet Union. So after the death of Iosif Stalin in 1953, there was a quite a lot of motion in Moscow, including tanks on the Red Square, uh, when several people were trying to become the leader, including Beria, who was the chief of secret police, but with the help of Zhukov, the famous uh, World War II general, Comrade Nikita Khrushchev became the first leader of the Communist Party of Soviet Union. The first unusual thing that Khrushchev did was his secret speech at the 20th gathering of the leaders of the Communist Party about Comrade Stalin and that in reality that Iosif Stalin wasn't that a good guy and about fight against the cult of personality, cult личности. But that speech was uh, classified for quite a long time so regular people never knew about it till probably 80s and or even 90s. As I mentioned, Nikita Khrushchev was a quite unusual character and he had a lot of nicknames that people used to call him. One of those, one of which was Khrushchev. So like his last name was Khrushchev. So his nickname was Khrushchev, which is the name for the bug. It's kind of like a scarab bug or another name is a May bug, Maisky Zhuk. And uh, that was one of his nicknames. Another nickname he had was Kukuruznik. Uh, which is 
hard to translate, we also had a name for the airplane who was spraying chemicals and was called Kukuruznik, but it's a person who really likes corn. Kukuruza means corn on Russian. So how did Khrushchev become Kukuruznik? Well, it all started after his visit uh, to United States when he got so impressed with the amount of corn that America was having and growing. So returning back to Soviet Union, he ordered uh, to do a massive switch from wheat uh, and other grains to corn. And that was a major disaster because most of the uh, territory of Soviet Union is uh, not suitable for growing corn. Uh, so we had outright a lot of uh, wheat disappeared, so we had shortages of bread. And the cornbread that showed up at the stores, people didn't like it at all. So that's the reason why he got the nickname Kukuruznik. If you're interested in history of Soviet Union, you should remember his famous words, we will bury you, although that was not a correct translation. When we Russians say, we will bury you or I will bury you, it's similar when your wife tells you, I'm going to kill you. It really doesn't mean that, but it's the same idea. It's just, we really don't like you and we're going to do everything possible to beat you, but it's not like we're going to kill you for real. Do you know that Crimea became part of Ukraine thanks to Nikita Khrushchev? And it happened in 1954 when there was a 300th anniversary of the historic decision by Ukraine to unify with Tsarist Russia. Prior to that, for over 200 years, Crimea was part of Russia. Also, during Khrushchev rule, uh, we had a major breakup between Soviet Union and China. There's a lot of uh, versions of what happened. Uh, one of the th uh, things might happen that Khrushchev refused Mao to share nuclear secrets, how to build a nuclear bomb. Um, another rumor or theory is that uh, Soviet Union didn't support China during a Chinese-Indian war. They just announced uh, neutrality. So Ch Chinese got pissed, Indians got pissed. So this is what happened. The biggest two socialist country in the world, China and Soviet Union, uh, became mad at each other. And of course, Berlin Wall. It was built uh, under Khrushchev and as I believe it was his decision because they were afraid that the whole population of Eastern Germany eventually gonna run away to the West so they decided to fix it the our way, just build a big, big wall. And we all know how this idea of uh, protecting your borders with walls work now because Berlin Wall failed and Great Wall of China just became a really interesting uh, tourist attraction. One of the biggest Khrushchev achievements was his construction project all over the country when millions and millions of square feet or square meters of new housing was built. It was built quick, it was built cheap, but over 60 million Soviet families got their own apartments thanks to Khrushchevki project. I'm planning to talk more about living conditions of Soviet people in my next videos when I'm planning to tell you the story of my family, but there was a horrible shortage of housing in Soviet Union during the Stalin regime. And many people lived in the horrible uh, conditions in wooden barracks or so-called kommunalki when former nice big apartments were split in little tiny rooms, which one family was uh, living in a separate room and then five or six or ten families will be sharing the same kitchen and same bathroom. Well, under Khrushchev, they started this major construction project and over 60 million Soviet families got their own apartments. Um, 
that construction was uh, really fast and cheap and houses looked really basic, primitive and they got the nickname Khrushchevka on the, after Comrade Khrushchev. Of course, uh, under Stalin there were also some construction going on but those uh, houses that got the name Stalin Key they were built really well, they had really tall ceilings, about 10 feet tall ceilings, uh, nice outside in the neoclassic style, so they were uh, building them slow and not enough. Khrushchevka was a quite an opposite thing. It was very simplified panels and bricks, usually five-story high buildings, with flat roof, no balconies, no elevators. Uh, they could be built in three months and original lifespan was only 25 years. So that was built quick and cheap just to help people to get better living conditions. And in 20 years, Comrade Khrushchev was 100% sure the Soviet Union will enter a communism phase and then there'll be beautiful houses all over the place and we can tear down those temporary Khrushchevka buildings. And of course we have to mention the first satellite, Sputnik, first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, although there are rumors going on that maybe there was a big fake project and in reality Yuri Gagarin never made it to outer space, but I won't be uh, touching that topic. Also we sent the very first dog in space and managed to get two dogs back, Bielka and Strelka. We took a picture of the dark side of the moon. Of course we managed to uh, shoot down powers on his Lockheed U-2 spy plane. And of course, we cannot forget about the Caribbean crisis. In order to really understand what happened during the Cuban crisis in 1962, you need to roll tape a little bit back and see what happened in 1961 when the United States deployed intermediate range Jupiter nuclear missiles in Italy and Turkey, right next to Soviet Union. Khrushchev really didn't like that, so he decided to give Americans a little bit of the same flavor. And that's how the Soviet nuclear missiles end up uh, in Cuba. And one of the reasons why Khrushchev got forcefully retired later on is because other Soviet leaders got so scared by his impulse decisions and uh, those high risk taking, although Khrushchev got what he wanted, he uh, agreed to remove missiles from Cuba in exchange that the remo missiles removed from Turkey, but the risk was so high and we got so close to nuclear exchange that it scared other uh, leaders of USSR and they got rid of Khrushchev as quick as they could. Another interesting story about Khrushchev's visit to USA that besides corn, he brought back Pepsi. And I'm not sure if it's true, but uh, I read some articles uh, that he tried Pepsi uh, during the visit and he liked it so much, as well as corn, uh, that they made arrangement and for the Pepsi concentrate, Russia or Soviet Union was sending Stolichna vodka to United States and that's how you guys got Stoli and Soviet people got the taste of Pepsi and for years till 1990s the only American pop we could buy in Soviet Union it was Pepsi and Fanta. We had five uh, factories set up in Soviet Union one of them was in Kiev and you could purchase a bottle of Pepsi, the small one, 
uh, I believe it was 0.33 liters for 15 Copex, which was kind of pricey. Uh, I personally liked Pepsi a lot and <laughs> for me the best snack was a bottle of Pepsi and fresh white bread. So I hope you enjoyed my story about Nikita Khrushchev and as always don't forget to like my video, please share with your friends and if you really really like this show now, there's a little button on top right when you can make a small donation to help uh, this channel going. Thank you very much comrades.
And today we have another episode, episode number 18 of my review of Black on Red, My 44 Years Inside the Soviet Union by Robert Robinson. And just a friendly reminder, in case if you're new to my channel or somehow missed it, I have a separate playlist where all these videos are located and I'll provide the link below in the comment section. In this episode, we'll take a look at some events that occurred in spring of 1954. So Comrade Stalin is dead. Comrade Malenkov lost the power struggle and new leader of the Soviet Union is Nikita Khrushchev. So Robert Robertson writes, in the spring of 1954, Khrushchev began an amnesty program to review the cases of people who had been arrested and deported during the purges of 1933 to 1938. Although purges began way before that. Many innocent prisoners were freed and others who had been declared enemies of people, Bragi Naroda, and shot or who had died had their records re rehabilitated. Khrushchev's amnesty committee often designated wives or children of a deceased husband or father to receive some form of compensation. So Robert Robertson is talking here about rehabilitacja, as we say it in Russian, and it was a huge undertaking that began in 1953-54, and by the end, when the process was done, over 4 million people were rehabilitated. I mean, it's an enormous amount. Out of this 4 million people, almost 2.5 million were sentenced to go to the labor camps. And as we talked about it, I strongly believe that Stalin was looking for free slave labor and he got over 2 million of slaves working in the Gulag labor camps, mining gold mining other precious metals, cutting trees down so he can get going with his industrialization. Around 765,000 were deported. So a lot of these people were members of the family. So for example, if a father was convicted as being enemy of the people, the whole family now becomes, they become an family members of the enemy of the people. We had special abbreviation for it. And usually those people faced a deportation. And of course, the whole nations were deported as well, such as uh, Volga region Germans or Crimean Tatars in 1944. Around 643,000 people were shot right away. And close to 30% of people who went to labor camps had also perished. And here's the example of such a spravka. So this is a document uh, proving that the person was rehabilitated. As, as you see on the top left, it was issued on October 22nd, 1956. And it says that a person named Gorsky Alexander Klementievich, that his case was reviewed on October 13, 1956. And due to the newly discovered evidence, although it doesn't specify what kind of evidence, the criminal case, which was open on October 25th, 1938, was canceled due to the lack of uh, criminal activity. And Gorsky was rehabilitated. And let's see if we can do this word. Posthumously. There we go. He was rehabilitated. Posthumously. And I don't know about you, but I would have mixed feelings about the getting such a document, such as Pravka, so your husband or your father was shot by the government for no reason, there was no crime. So, hey, but good news, he is rehabilitated. And Comrade Robertson met a person that went through this nightmare. He writes, A few months after this program began, I was startled to happen upon Marusia Kudinov in the GUM department store. So that's in Moscow. It had been 21 years since her husband, the party secretary in the Stalingrad factory where I who first worked, had been declared an enemy of the people and shot. Marusia had aged tremendously. Through only in her 50s, he looked 20 years older. So this lady told Mr. Robinson, the amnesty committee called me to say that a grave error had been made and, they, and that they had found him to be totally innocent. He was given a medal. <laughs> Tears were welling in her eyes as she continued. Now I have been given a small two-room apartment and a pension of 140 rubles a month. Once a year I can go to one of the best curing sanatoriums in the country for my rheumatism. So at least she got a little bit compensation, but of course it will never 
you know, she will never get her husband back. And Miss Robinson said, fortunately, your life has now become somewhat more comfortable. Yes, that is true, she said. But after those many long, lonely, tragic years, it is hard for me to feel grateful. So as I mentioned earlier, this process of rehabilitation of the innocent victims of Stalin projects began in 1953-54. Then after Brezhnev replaced Khrushchev, that process kind of stopped almost. They slammed on the brakes really hard. And at some point, Brezhnev was actually trying to restore the image of Stalin. But then after the collapse of the Soviet Union, this process kicked in again. And in modern Russia, so between 1992 and 2004, so it's a little bit outdated data, an additional 634,165 people were rehabilitated. So can you imagine 1992, so that's what we're talking about, 60, almost 60 years after purges and people finally being rehabilitated? Similarly, in modern Ukraine, between 1991 and 2001, 248,710 people were rehabilitated. And looks like the government commission on amnesty was just going case by case uh, because people were just getting in the mail uh, as postcard requesting them to appear before the amnesty committee on a certain date and time. So Robert Robertson met another person. Uh, so the daughter uh, of the father that was shot, Clara, she said she went to the office and uh, she found the building, entered the large room, and gave her card to a man behind one of the several small windows. So he asked, uh, tell me your father's full name and date of birth. And the guy said, Clara told him. Then he asked for her mother's passport, which she handed to him and told her that her father had been arrested in prison and died. He has now been found innocent of all charges, said the man. The government has not only graciously exonerated him posthumously, but will compensate his nearest relatives. So they got a sealed envelope with the words that he was exonerated in 1956, Stepan Nikolaevich Roskin, and inside of the envelope was the 800 rubles, barely enough to buy a new coat. This is the cost of life in Soviet Russia. And when I was getting ready for this video, doing some research, I was thinking about my grandfather, Sergei. Uh, he was a POW in Germany during the World War II, and Americans uh, set him free and then transferred him to the Soviets, and he ended up uh, being checked by NKVD in the so-called filtration camp. So every Soviet citizen who ended up on the German side, being as like an Osterbeiter, you know, forced labor person or POW, they all went through so-called filtration camps where it was determined if they could be just let go and they could go home. Or like in case of my grandfather, since he was a POW, traitor of the country, uh, he was sent to the labor camp in Donetsk region and he almost died there. And I made a video about it a while back. If you're interested, I'll provide the link below in the comment section. Interestingly enough, many individuals were subjects to amnesty only, but not to rehabilitation, especially those who were prosecuted uh, for belonging to so-called uh, Trotskysky Organizatsiya, or Trotskyite's opposition. So those people, they got amnesty, but they still were guilty in the eyes of the Soviet government. But when the Soviet Union disappeared in the late of 1991, even Leon Trotsky, Lev Trotsky, who was murdered in 1940, was rehabilitated on June 16, 2001. And I remember reading somewhere that during Brezhnev era, you know, people were requesting information like, what happened to my you know, grandpa or my father, because he was, you know, sent to the labor camp and we never heard of him. And quite often KGB will provide a document and they will pretty much lie. They'll say, yeah, your father died from heart attack, you know, in 1940, although he was shot, executed in, in 1938. So a lot of times it will be like heart attacks was actually uh, being executed. And that was a, another Soviet newspeak when a person gets 10 years of labor camps without the right of correspondence, so he can't write any letters, is actually what I meant. He was executed, and that's why he wouldn't be able to write any letters. So that was a bad sign if your relative gets 10 years of labor camps with no right of correspondence, he will never write you a letter again, ever. 
And it makes me so sad that even now, so many people think that that Stalin's bloody lemonade was worth the squeeze, that that economic miracle was built on the bones of millions of innocent Soviet people, that it was all worth it. This is really sickening. Well, on this positive note, I'll be wrapping up this video. I hope you learned something new today and we'll talk to you soon. Today's video is episode number 17 of my book review of the book Black on Red, My 44 Years Inside of the Soviet Union by Robert Robinson. In case if you're new to my channel, I have a separate playlist dedicated to this book and I'll provide the link below in the comment section. In today's episode, we're going to discuss another interesting change that occurred in 1953 after the death of Stalin. All right, so page 278. A minor, I don't know why he decides that was a minor change, but welcome benefit that occurred in 1953 after the death of Stalin was the discontinuation of the tardiness law. In the early 30s, soon after I started work at the first state ball bearing plant, the Central Committee, Committee of the Party, issued a disciplinary decree designed to end the habitual tardiness of Russian workers. So here Robert Robertson talking about the laws that were passed in the late 30s and early 40s, and I think 1940s that we need to talk more about it. So those laws provided the legal basis for draconian measures against industrial workers. On December 20, 1938, so the Council of People's Commissars approved the decree on the obligatory introduction of work books in all enterprises and institutions, a law designed to attack labor turnover and to reduce the free movement of labor among enterprises. So imagine being a worker in Moscow or any other large city. So you already have Article 58 hanging above your head for 10 years since 1927. So any worker at any moment could be snatched away by NKVD had to admit that he was enemy of the people and being sent to the gulag labor camps or just being shot. So on the top of it, now they trying to make you work harder and reduce your free movement. So if you don't like your job, you literally like not allowed to move and change the job without permission. So let's see what other changes they made in the labor. Labor contracts were increased to five year terms. So just like five year plans for the whole country, you had a labor contract that minimum is five years. So once you committed to work at the factory, you're stuck there for at least five years. All job changes, salary, and reward histories, punishments, rebukes, and reasons for firings were registered in the labor book, Rabochekniska, just like my parents had, which the cadres department used to evaluate workers' performance. In January of 1939, the Council of People's Commissars decreed that tardiness of 20 minutes or more constituted an unauthorized absence from work. And let's see what Robert Robertson says about the same law. The disciplinary decree said, Two days after publication, anyone who comes to work more than 20 minutes late is to be discharged and will evacuate the place where he or she lives and will be banished from Moscow with no right to appeal. So you're losing your factory housing and you'll be kicked out of Moscow. So you literally will get fired and lose place to live for being late for 20 minutes or more. But Mr. Robertson mentioned that in my factory, very few workers, technicians, and office staff reported for work on time with any regularity. People frequently would arrive as much as a half an hour late and sometimes leave before lunch. There was absolutely no discipline. So that decree came out to enforce it. And then he describes his first day of the decree. On the first day of the decree was enforced, I woke up late at 7.10. Even though I was an American citizen, I did not care to stand out as a violator of the new ordinance. I leapt out of bed, threw on my clothes, and ran down the stairs without trying to tie my shoelaces. Not in my tie and race to work. I arrived 10 minutes late. So he made it. Scores of others were racing into the shop out of breath and unkept. A designer I knew dashed in unshaven, his hair mess, wearing one black shoe, and one brown one. And then he mentioned something extremely interesting. So totally unusual side effect of this tardiness law 
For nearly a year after enactment of the tardiness law, the number of arrests by Moscow Police Department rose steeply and about 3,000 rubles in fines were collected each day from workers desperate to avoid conviction under the new law. People who were going to arrive late for work and needed an official excuse to avoid being punished under the harsh tardiness decree would get themselves arrested for minor infractions. They smashed streetcar, train, or taxi windows, were taken to the police station, paid a fine, and received a precious receipt, so like a spravka, which they could present at work to indicate that they had an acceptable excuse for being late. This is amazing. <laughs> then he continues. We had one set case in my machine shop where a man who lived just five minute walk from the factory arrived 22 minutes late for work, two minutes past the cutoff period. He was fired on the spot and told to vacate his apartment. He refused to leave. So a few days later, his furniture was loaded onto a van and taken away, and he was locked out. Incidents such as this helped the workers to reorganize their lives so they could report to work on time, and the window smashing greatly diminished after the first year. In Soviet Russia, one day you have apartment, and the next day you don't, because you are late for 22 minutes, to show up at your work. But I'm very surprised that Robert Robinson never mentioned another decree uh, dated from June 26, 1940. So the Presidium of Supreme Soviet approved the decree on the transition to eight-hour workday, a seven-day work week, and the prohibition of voluntary departures of workers from enterprises and institutions. So that law tied the worker to the enterprise and introduced criminal punishments for laziness, poor discipline, and tardiness. In August of 1940, so the same year, criminal punishments were introduced for minor workplace infractions such as drunkenness, hooliganism, and petty theft. The October 1940 reforms of vocational education raised the term of obligatory work after graduation to four years and prohibited voluntary departures. In some schools, criminal punishments were given for discipline violations and for unauthorized leaves. So 1940 law was like, it's not just you're gonna lose your apartment, you're going to prison or labor camp for minor workplace infractions. And while researching for this topic of 1940 uh, law of the criminal punishment for the minor workplace problems, I found that a lot of people say that was actually a good idea to do because, you know, country was getting ready for war and that needs to be done to reinforce the discipline. But I was like, wait a minute, it's 1940, it's a one year before so-called surprise Nazi invasion. So in 1941, for some reason, no one saw war coming, no one expected Germany to attack. But just a year prior, everyone knew war is around the corner, so let's work for longer hours, let's have only one day off, and let's punish criminally anyone who doesn't do a good job. So it seems as Nikita Khrushchev did a huge amount of work to make life in the Soviet Union more bearable for the average person. This draconian tardiness law was canceled later on, I believe in 1961, Article 51 was removed. So people's life was getting better, and it's even before the massive construction of apartment buildings, so-called Khrushchevka, had begun, that let millions of Soviet families get housing, like, I won't call it decent housing, but it was definitely better than living in a dorms or communal apartments, kommunalne kvartiry. By the way, a while back, I already made a video about Nikita Khrushchev, and if you somehow missed that story, I'll post the link below in the comment section. And I find surprising that despite all those great things that Nikita Khrushchev did for the Soviet people, he was portrayed rather in a kind of bad light in the late Soviet Union as well as in modern Russia. Like, he is considered to be a bad leader, kind of like this bolsterous village person that was really rude and uh, just not a good leader. And some of you may know that Nikita Khrushchev received the nickname Kukuruznik. So there's like a Kukuruza man, the corn man, because he worked so hard to introduce corn 
in the Soviet agriculture and it was a total disaster, complete failure. It's a separate story. And But I find similarities between Nikita Khrushchev and Jimmy Carter because Jimmy Carter similarly had a nickname of peanut farmer. Although he finished college, he got a degree in engineering and he was actually an officer in a nuclear submarine at his time. So he was not just a peanut farmer. And as we see later in the Robert Robertson book, uh, Nikita Khrushchev uh, attempted to replace the terror with excitement for the Soviet people. Like, okay, I don't want to force you to work hard because you are horrified of the government. I want you to work hard because you're so excited with our achievements. And we're going to talk about Sputnik and other space race items in the next story. Okay, my friends, it's all for you today. Thank you for watching Oshanka's show. As always, please don't forget to like this video and we'll talk to you soon. До свидания. Goodbye.